got an idea in my mind that if I was casting, why couldn't I cast a thousand pieces? So um, that's what I decided to do rashly. And it took me a while to figure out how to make those pieces so that it had the qualities of transparency at the top and kind of weightiness around the base. And then once I had that worked out, it was, you know, a question of just making and making and making repetitively. One of the qualities I love about clay is, you know, that it can take any shape, it can take any form. And I wanted to make a piece that, in its final form, expressed that quality of clay which in a way you don't see in the final object because of course it's fired and it's become static and quite still. But I wanted to keep a sense of that, you know, that dynamic quality of movement and fluidity and flexibility and plasticity. So it seemed to me that a bit like cells in a body or something repeating endlessly, that if you could have hundreds, a thousand of the same thing, the eye would move over it very fluidly and you get that kind of kinetic, sense back again. It shifts from white, very small, small, very shallow pieces at, at the very edge of it, which of course is like the foam scattering on, on, on the sand, and then it starts to just build and goes through white to kind of grey, back to white, and then it starts to muddle with the colour, and it starts to rise to this intense experience of colour. Well, every time it's shown, it's going to be slightly different, which I really, really like. There's always a kind of random creative element to it. A bit like children's toys, you know, building blocks. There's a sort of playfulness about, about it. Casting is an industrial process, or rather, it's used a lot in industry because it's, you know, it's an efficient way of making lots and lots of the same thing. I will be using liquid clay, which for some reason is called casting slip. Um, actually, slip often refers to clay that's mixed with water. You then pour it into your plaster mould, and then because the plaster is a very, very porous material, it will be sucking out the water from the liquid slip, from the casting slip, and you leave it in the mould for a certain amount of time and then you pour the rest out and then you just let the piece sort of harden up. So it just means that, you know, you can line up your moulds, particularly the small ones, and do a lot of, make a lot of pieces quite, quite quickly. Or at least that's the quick part of it, because then I take each piece once it's been cast, and it has quite an uneven rim, and I'll then put it on the wheel and then turn the rim so it's even finer, so again, you're just pushing it. I wanted to have that contrast between an extremely fine rim and quite a thick-set body, so that you could have the halo and transparent qualities at the top, but then have a very thick covering of colour. I'm trying to get the glaze on very, very thickly because I want that almost three-dimensional quality to the surface so that when the light hits it, it's kind of travelling through a certain depth of colour. It's not just sitting on the surface. So the depth of the glaze is really important. So I will double dip, which means I glaze twice. So I'll glaze the inside twice, let it dry and then glaze the outside. I work with one, what I call a base glaze recipe. It's like the mothership, and then all the other colours come from that. Um, or rather, I add colour to the one base glaze. And I've been using that for quite a long time now. 
And one of the reasons I, I use just one glaze is because colour is so confusing. You can get so lost in it. But I thought I have to put some constants in, you know, something where it, something doesn't move, something is the same. The consistency is really, really important with, with the work that I do. So, you know, the best way is to stick your hand in and move it around and then you get a feel for it. You know, is it like double cream? Is it like single cream? I was working with a Chinese glaze expert called Nigel Woods and he used to visit China and excavate shards of old pottery and he would then analyse it and work out what the components were and then put that through a computer programme and come out with um, some specific glaze recipes, a bit like a Victoria sponge, you know, so many eggs, flour, sugar, but so many variations of, of those. And so I became very, very, very passionate about particular Chinese celadons called Long Xuans and Ying Jings, they were called. Um, but they each had a slightly different hue. Some were green, some were slightly grey, some were slightly blue. But they were very, very Chinese. Um, and so that's where it started for me. I just did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests. There's something about the, the edges that's so amazing with porcelain. You know, where you get that sharp edge and where the glaze pulls away from it. I think that's incredible. combine the colours a lot, so I use industrial stains with natural oxides. Sometimes I layer them, you know, to get, to get that depth. The colour itself will lead you in an unexpected direction, so it's not about controlling the colour. I think that's what I, I love about it. it. It feels like a, like a dialogue, you know. You're sort of, you have a, an idea and you follow it and then it then leads you in another direction. So it feels a bit like a dance in some way. to find a clay that was very, 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 very white because I knew that I wanted to work with colour. And of course it's like having a very, very white piece of paper that right from the beginning you're starting with a kind of luminous base. So that's, that was my quest. So when I was doing my MA I tried lots and lots and lots of different clays, including stoneware as well and then heard about this clay that had just been made. Um, and there's a very, very white seam of China clay in Tasmania. And a potter from Tasmania got a grant to um, make this clay, to, to work on it. It took him six years. And so this is the one that I use. It's fantastic. start with the same bag of clay and some of it goes to throwing and some of it goes to hand building, some of it goes to um, casting. And I think that's what I really enjoy about my practice generally is, you know, you use the method that you need in order to make the piece that you want to make. So, um, you know, not just tied to one way of making.